Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Everybody, um, If you guys are in Florida, you might be seeing the very rainy weather that we've got out today. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's a nice thing to do and stay cozy at home for sure. Um, just a heads up, we do have a few contingency plans in case there's power outages. So just bear with us for sure um, as we weather this storm. But thank you so much for joining us for today's Behind the Science, a Wednesday web chat. I'm your host, Madeline Arncedia from the Outreach and Engagement Department. And today's guest is Dr. Laurent Cherubin. Laurent has been at Harbor Branch since 2013, and he specializes in ocean dynamics, which is understanding why the water moves the way that it does. And he uh, does a lot of work trying to establish how forces like gravity or the wind or even the moon affect the way that water moves and also the ecosystems under the water. Um, so he does a lot of that work and he also does a lot of other cool projects. He's currently the lead investigator for the DARPA funded grouper guard project which is trying to understand if Goliath grouper vocalizations can be used to as a like, first line of defense or an alert system for national defense. So uh, hopefully we'll hear a lot about some of these cool projects today. Um, a couple quick things before we dive into that. As always, if you guys have any questions for Laurent, you want to hear them. If you're on Zoom, go ahead and use that Q&A button at the bottom center of your screen to ask your questions. If you're on Facebook, just comment your questions and we'll definitely get to those as well. And we also want to know where you're tuning in from. So feel free to shout out, say hi and where you're staying if you're seeing this uh, weather that we've got here in Florida right now as well. Um, so we'll get Laurent joined in here now and uh, go ahead and get started. So uh, Laurent, thank you uh, so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So we usually like to start just with a little bit of background, some general info, a couple of things about you that might not be on your resume. Um, like what? <laughs> I don't know. Whatever you want. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I'm um, originally from the, the French West Indies, uh, an island in the Caribbean called Guadeloupe. Uh, basically, I went to uh, throughout uh, high school over there. And then uh, after that, um, I went to France for college and uh, also did my PhD in France. And then uh, that took me uh, a little bit uh, different places. Uh, after I got my PhD, I spent some time in England, in uh, Cambridge, and I also spent some time in Portugal uh, for two years uh, before I uh, finally landed in the US in 2002. And then uh, I landed in Miami. Uh, I started working at the Ozen Seal School of Mine and Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami. And I spent about uh, my first 13 years of my career there as a scientist, basically. Uh, so ocean science, physical science scientist. And then um, my next job was actually at, at Harbor Branch. So since 2013, I've been uh, at Harbor Branch as an associate professor. And um, that's where you find me today. OK. So uh, you started off. I'm sorry, you said in New Guinea? Did I get that right? I'm sorry. It's a little hard to hear you. Sorry. Um, I, I started off uh, in terms of my research. Um, no, I'm sorry. I think you said where you grew up and then you went oh, to France for in your... The, yeah, in the, in the French island of Guadeloupe. Okay, Guadeloupe. Sorry, I got that mixed up there. Um, so when was it living there that got you inspired to pursue ocean research or what was sort of that moment for you that set you off on that grand journey? <laughs> um, well, there are many um, elements in my family that led me to there in some ways. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was a fisherman. Um, so artisanal fisheries in the Caribbean. And then uh, my grandfather was uh, on my father's side was a physician actually. Uh, was also uh, 
uh, I mean, love the oceans and had a lot of books in this library about uh, the oceans. And a lot of those books were actually uh, Cousteau's uh, books that they, uh, that they wrote back in the days about sharks, about uh, diving with, uh, with uh, seals and uh, in the cold seas, about dolphins, about whales. And so that's what you kind of see on those uh, images. These are the covers of the books that, that my grandfather had and that basically sort of like uh, really uh, triggered my curiosity and my interest uh, for the ocean. So I guess that's where my passion is from. And then uh, my dad who was a fisherman, you know, used to wake me up at three in the morning to go fishing and, and I would definitely, and I was, you know, going with him. So I wouldn't stay in bed. I was really excited even at three in the morning being a young kid, you know, 10 years old and you go fishing at three and then yes, I'm going. Are you still a fisherman? Am I still a fisherman more than ever? Sometimes I say, you know, I live to fish, but anyways, <laughs> that's enough. <nice. laughs> okay. Well, we actually had a question from the public that came in before the chat even started asking um, if you are a vegetarian. They'd heard something about that. And so I'm curious, when you go fishing, do you eat what you catch? <laughs> Uh, absolutely, yeah. Nothing is wasted. Uh, I like to eat what I what I uh, what I catch. I like to cook fish, um, and also I like to you know share that with my friends. So if I invite my friends to go fishing, but also give fish to my friends. And okay. so, not a vegetarian then? <laughs> not vegetarian, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, so fishing was a great inspiration. I'm sure, and then going into more of the school stuff, what was it about ocean dynamics that drew you to that? Was that something that just sort of happened throughout your schooling or? Um, kind of inadvertently, it's, um, so when I was uh, finishing uh, my bachelor, actually, uh, I did my bachelor in, uh, solid mechanics and fluid dynamics. So already there, and uh, I had a, one of my professors in fluid mechanics was a very inspiring guy. And I still remember some of his lectures to this day. And that was a long time ago, that was in the 90s. And um, I remember one of his lectures being about uh, flow around objects. And uh, one of his lectures was about, the, one of those objects was actually uh, fish tails. And then he showed us that depending on the, the shape of the, the tail of a fish, it would, it would be that the shape of the tail would be adapted to a certain um, swimming behavior. And that kind of stuck with me. And then uh, there were a lot of applications about, you know, airplanes, even tennis balls, uh, uh, all kind of uh, interaction of, of fluid, so whether it's air or water with the objects. And that really caught to me because, you know, already being a fisherman back in the day, also loving uh, nautical activities, I was really into understanding this kind of uh, processes and dynamics. And so um, back in my school, um, you know, one of the, the big, uh, I would say, industry that they were working with were Companies like Danone, for instance. Danone, what do they do? They make yogurts. But what is important about yogurts is the texture and the fluidity, the viscosity of the yogurt in your mouth. And that would define how you like the yogurt. So uh, I remember starting getting interested into, you know, I thought that was an interesting uh, approach and uh, aspect of uh, food, uh, basically, and how human interact with foods. Um, and then as I was about to choose where I was going to go, I stumbled upon a, a NAD from a, a master's program about ocean dynamics. And then I realized that, man, something I should try because that looks more like something that relates to me. And so I decided to explore that venue and I got accepted into the program and that's how it started. And uh, that was one of the programs in France. And so that was one of the program in France and then I started in Marseille, where that was the university I was affiliated with to do my master's and then my PhD program. And then after my PhD, and for my PhD, then I moved to another part of France in Brittany, where they have a huge naval base there. And I got a scholarship from the Navy to do my PhD. And that's where I did my PhD in a Navy lab up there in Brittany in France. Okay, I think we maybe have a picture from that PhD program. 
with yeah. some awesome glasses right there. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, that's the lab where I did my PhD and the people you see on the pictures are all my uh, uh, colleagues and friends in, in that lab. And then basically I owe it where, what, who I am today and the research I am today to the guy who's wearing the Top Gun uh, glasses who is my PhD advisor. And uh, the other thing that's uh, the other iconic features in that picture is the big stone that's behind uh, the people there. So I'm, I'm actually standing right behind my advisor. And then uh, you see that big stone in the back. This stone is actually uh, typical from the region where I come from. It reminds you maybe for some people of Ireland, Stonehenge, you have this giant, this alignment of giant stones. Well, that stone uh, is also part of the culture in that region of France, Brittany, and it's also uh, a, a great uh, sort of feature in one of the comic books called Asterix and Obelix that I used to read when I was a kid. So the big stone that Obelix is carving is actually the stone that you see behind us. It's called a menia. Did you get to chip away at it? Of course. <laughs> every day we had to chip some stone away. Yeah. <laughs> That's what science is like, though. It feels like chipping away stone slowly but surely. Yeah, exactly. To come to the essence of things, yeah. Okay. So from grad school till now, is there a favorite project that you could think of that you've worked on? Oh, there were many projects, but, um, you know, growing up in the Caribbean and, and, and the French islands, and I could say the Caribbean in general, um, you know, we used to go in the water and see a lot of fish, healthy calls and all those things. And just like in the Florida Keys, you know, back in the 80s, 70s, 80s. And then over time, and I think, you know, for me, I think I felt like it happened overnight. Uh, from one day to another, um, a lot of the calls were dead. We used to have like those call, those grooves of calls that would run from the shallow water to the deep water and that were covered in calls and, and suddenly one day, you know, there were either no fish or most of the coral was dead. So that really um, struck me and, 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 um, and um, I, I guess I lost my thought. What was your question again? Uh, it was about uh, one of your favorite projects that you worked on. Yeah, so, um, you know, and it's something that led me to basically think that uh, the, the purpose of my work, and I remember when I interviewed at Rasmus, they said, what, what did you want to do? I said, I wanted to save groupers. And so uh, I guess that stayed with me through my career because now I'm the lead uh, investigator on the Grouper Guard project. Uh, but um, one of the projects that really stayed with me is uh, that work that we've done in the Caribbean where we went down and look at the uh, group of spawning allegation. And I was really amazed by seeing the amount of life and the amount of fish that was present on that reef. And all of that because of uh, the conservation effort that uh, the, the US government had put in that place. And so that's what you see on this film here. These are all fish that are all legal size to catch in Florida. So I would say, you know, for like a black grouper, 24 inches and above. And you have probably 10 of thousands of them at that specific location during that, that, that time where we put down an ROV. And what you see here is basically the video collected by the ROV, looking at all those uh, fish in, uh, you know, mating colors and ready to spawn and basically uh, produce the next generation that, uh, the, you know, uh, of, of fish. And so, what you see here is basically what the ocean should look like anywhere in the world. And this image may not be uh, true anymore, you know, today and in the next 20 or 30 years as, as at, the way, at the rate we're doing, you know, we're uh, harvesting fish from the ocean, uh, those guys are going to be gone. So um, it was really amazing to me to see that, that vision that I had when I was a kid going in the water wasn't dead yet and that there's still hope for this to be uh, you know still something we can see our kids can see in the future so yeah that was one of the most fascinating experience actually uh, that I had in my career. So I guess what was the 
project part of that, other than being amazing and beautiful? Uh, what were you guys trying to study with those fish? So um, when it comes to fish, and that ties with uh, you know my uh, my my research is understanding uh, the environment that define the habitat where the fish live. So let's say those fish you live on the reef for a reason, right? Um, and they go spawning in a specific location for very specific reasons and multiple reasons that we don't really have a good understanding of. And uh, so one of the reasons that we think is the main driver is that they look for uh, an environment that's remote enough uh, so that they can release their larvae where uh, and the habitat, the environment where they release their larvae would provide food and protection to their larvae so that they can survive before actually they return to the reef where they will grow to become juveniles and become adults. So uh, this environment is defined by uh, a lot of physical factors such as current, temperature, salinity, water density, and those things. And um, so what we were trying to do is to measure the, the, the physical environment at the same time as we were uh, measuring the fish activity in terms of spawning. Cool. I never thought about that connection. I mean, it's definitely important. And honestly, when you talked about yogurt earlier and you made that connection to like the texture and the feeling of things and how it affects your perception of it, that's got to be the same for the fish. <laughs> Absolutely, you, you, you're absolutely right. They they feel the the environment in a way we're not able to feel it. They have sensors that, uh, you know, that provide them with cues that define their behavior in response to those cues. So if the current becomes too strong, they may not spawn. They may hide close to the bottom and stay there until the current gets better. Um, if the water temperature is not correct, they know it's not good for their eggs because the, the buoyancy of their eggs is a reflection of the density of the water. And so the eggs may not end up going where they're supposed to go, which means that they may not hatch in a favorable environment, which means that their entire um, output will, might be wasted, basically. So it's very important for them to cue to the right uh, cues at their right values so that their the survivorship of their offspring is maximized. Mm -hmm. What's been the most surprising thing that you found while you've been studying groupers and their habitats and everything? Um, so um, coming to Harbor Branch, I, I was, you know, that was one of the big things that attracted me to Harbor Branch is the fact that you can really merge technology in, in let's say, uh, you know, empirical research or um, uh, theoretical research. And so we can use um, technology, really advanced technology to help us understand the environment that uh, we are uh, studying. And so uh, one of the, the system that I started using when I came to Harbor Branch and I got a grant actually to purchase that system was a wave ladder, which is basically a, a standard pilot board with solar panels, so a lot of sensors on it, and that can move around uh, using the action, the wave action. And so we started building that system, uh, developing sensors for that system and use the sensors as a way to uh, basically scan the ocean to listen for sound. And because what we realized uh, with other colleague, colleagues of mine is that the groupers, for instance, that I showed you, the, which are uh, yellowfin groupers and also a few nasal groupers actually produce sound when they aggregate to spawn. And those sounds are very distinctive. And so we develop like um, tools that you can, basically it's like a mat that you can plug it on your hydrophone that will tell you, recognize the sound, detect the sound, analyze the sound, and uh, classify the sound in terms of the species that are producing those sounds. And so we did that um, as we were uh, putting this project together uh, we did that to survey, to look for goli groupers. And so uh, on the east coast of Florida. And so, as you may know, some of you may know, every year, um, uh, goli groupers aggregate in certain locations to spawn. And it's a big, a huge uh, diving uh, attraction. And so a lot of divers, divers, for instance, go to those uh, reefs that are of Jupiter 
uh, beach and basically dive of the sites where the grouper, the groupers aggregate to aggregate to spawn. And uh, I said aggregate to spawn, but actually that's not the right thing to say because we realized that after many observations that the grouper actually never spawn where you see them during the day where the, the diver actually uh, dive to see to see them. And so, um, but we didn't know any other place to go. So we sent our glider there and then the engineer that was in charge at that time made a mistake on the, the, the waypoint that glider was supposed to go. And that waypoint was slightly off the rake. And when we got there, we recorded a lot of Golai Gopal sound and realized that the pattern of the sound that we recorded through the night the glider was out there was very similar to the pattern that was recorded as an, at another site on the west coast of Florida where groupers are known to actually spawn. And so by doing that, we discovered accidentally a uh, Golai Grouper spawning irrigation site, which is, which is not where people think it is, slightly off the wrecks where people used to die. So that was one of the main discoveries that we did. And of course, we cannot reveal that location exactly for you know, the reason that I said earlier. So. What a fun mistake. <laughs> yes, it was a surprising mistake, actually. Yeah, and a good one. You never would have found it otherwise. No, and uh, <laughs> so thank you to the guy who made the mistake, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. And definitely good not to share the location. You got to protect those spawning groupers. Yeah. Uh, a quick reminder for our audience before we continue on, um, definitely ask your questions. Um, Laurent has lots of cool information to share. So um, if you're on Zoom, use the Q&A button. If you're on Facebook, just comment your questions and we can answer those as well. Um, so Laurent, you said something oh, during that time about how they make certain vocalizations during those spawning aggregations. Is that I assume that's typical of all groupers is that they have distinct vocalizations and that's sort of where grouper guard got started. Um, so yes, um, we know that, we only know that certain groupers have uh, produce calls. So I just want to make a little comment on, on uh, the use of the word vocalization. So uh, groupers like fish don't have a vocal cords, so they don't vocalize, but they produce sound. Okay, and the sound is more like a drumming sound because they have a, a swim bladder in their body and they have a muscles that can shake the swim bladder and by shaking the swim bladder, that's how they produce the sound. So it's, it's, a, it's a call basically, or if you want it, boom. And so uh, we know that some group of species uh, produce sound uh, when they aggregate to spawn and we call those some courtship associated sounds and it can be very specific and each species can have multiple variations of uh, the same sound. Uh, they can have uh, uh, so this drumming sort of roll, but also a tonal sound. So uh, just basically a note, like a musical note that varies in, in, uh, in frequency. So uh, we've learned to recognize those sound for, for, for you know, about five species. So if you want, I can tell you, so the Nassau grouper, the red hind, the yellowfin grouper, the black grouper, but also we know that the red grouper produces sound a lot on the West Florida shelf, for instance, and the goli grouper as well. But other species such as the gag grouper, the snowy grouper, or the wasu grouper, we know that we produce sound, but we don't know if those sound are specific to um, um, spawning activity. So there's still some research to be done there in order to find out if uh, actually there's sound related to uh, spawning behavior. But uh, the Golai grouper is interesting because it produces the same sound uh, regardless of its uh, activity. So it could be uh, anytime during the day outside spawning, spawning season or during spawning season. But what changes is the rate at which uh, it produces sound and the number of fish that are producing sound together. Okay. So, uh we have some people from the public interested in uh, the Grouper Guard project too. Can you tell us any more about it or? <laughs> yeah. So the idea behind the, the program is that uh, the Navy wants to use um, marine organisms as 
living sensors. So you know how we go in the ocean and we deploy sensors to measure current, to measure temperature, say humidity, turbidity, all sorts of, of, of chemical or physical parameters that provide us some, with some information that we can use to better understand how the oceans work and how our different ecosystems, marine ecosystems work. Um, but we don't know how fish actually sense their environment, what sensors that they uh, have internally that they use to understand how the environment around them uh, works. And so the idea is instead of uh, trying to build a sensor that um, is not, uh, you know, from the technology that we have available to us, why don't we use the animals that actually sensors and try to understand their behavior. So basically the response is to uh, stimuli in the environment, uh, try to understand that, to interpret it, to know what's happening around them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that does make sense. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so uh, one of the application of this project is to understand how the Golad grouper uh, coal production can be used and interpreted as uh, an alarm system to detect the presence of uh, intruders, if you want, if in our coastal environment. Cool. They're also really beautiful fish. That was a Goliath grouper, right? That's right. I don't know that I've ever actually seen one myself other than like that picture that's been up a lot. They are very cool looking. How big do Goliath groupers get? Um, up to 400 pounds. Uh, yeah, 700 pounds actually here is said, but yeah, they, they live very long. So, and they get very big uh, and, you know, and um, you can find them on artificial reef, natural reefs, uh, in very shallow water. So actually, one, you know, the life history of the Goliath grouper itself is very interesting because like many groupers, and I believe, you know, some people, are, um, people who like uh, aquariums uh, look for, you know, small fish to put in their aquariums, right? And uh, if you swim uh, in the summer months, like in coastal reef or grass areas along the coast of Florida, it happens that uh, you can find some small uh, artificial structures that we hold baby groupers. And so what, what uh, happens is, for instance, for Goliath groupers, they spawn offshore on those structures uh, or at the location I showed you about. And then by some miracles, the baby groupers will make their ways into our uh, coastal inlets and into the Indian River Lagoon, which becomes actually a habitat for juvenile Goliath groupers. And actually a harbor branch, uh, every year, there's always a group of five or six Goliath groupers that inhabit the channel. And they are juveniles, means they are less than one uh, meter long, and they spend the first maybe five years of their life in this uh, shallow environment. And same thing goes to the Everglades, actually, before they actually move offshore to uh, the adult uh, habitat. So uh, that's why you see, you know, having an environment that is uh, healthy for our ecosystem going from the near shore to offshore is very important because it connects all the different life stages of the animals that live in our oceans. So every part of our oceans is very important. Awesome. Uh, so before we get to those public questions, I have two more questions for you. Sure. One, the background that you've got going up. This is a really beautiful picture. Where is this from? <laughs> oh yeah, so that, that was uh, one of my research project in uh, uh, Belize's uh, Glover's Reef Atoll. So it's one of the um, few atolls in the Caribbean Sea. Um, and it's been, it's also the site of a spawning aggregation for NASA Roper, which actually spawn at both uh, ends of the atoll. Uh, but uh, the research project that I was involved with at that time uh, was, uh, um, the goal of this project was to understand how fish were distributed in terms of the different uh, dynamical uh, features in the atoll. So if you have a lot of current, basically you're gonna find a certain type of species 
And then that's the species that are going to be mostly into the channels or the passes between the inside of the atoll and the outside of the atoll. But as you move away from the high current area, you're going to have a, the, 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 the community composition uh, of species composition as you move away from the inlets will change because uh, the, the dynamics, the intensity of the flow will also decrease as you move away from the inlet. So that was the, the goal of this project. And then um, I also did some other work to understand uh, the dispersal of uh, fish eggs from the atoll, but that was more on the, the modeling side, the mathematical side, not so much on the, the field work. And then my other last question is, what advice would you give to a future scientist who's interested in ocean dynamics? That's a good question. Um, one thing I, I, I want to say is, you know, the, the, the uh, yeah. ocean science is a very young science compared to other science, compared to weather science or, you know, biology in general, and those sort of things. Because uh, the ocean environment is a very difficult environment to study, right? Because we don't live there. So, uh, and we don't breathe water, right? So we have no clue basically of what happens in the ocean unless we go in and see for ourselves. So uh, one of the, the, the key uh, thing about studying oceans is going and seeing for yourself because without observations, we cannot understand how the ocean works. So basically all the knowledge that we have about the oceans is because we went and see it and by chance or other, uh, you know, um, serendipity effect, we uh, stumbled upon some features that was happening in the ocean. We decided to put some sensors in there to measure and, and understand what was happening. And that's how we got our understanding of the ocean. So I would say that if, if you love ocean science and you, you're a very curious person and you're not afraid of going out and, and seeing for yourself, um, and that's the kind of thing you like to do, this is really a good field to you. Um, you know, to satisfy your uh, thirst for uh, discoveries, for uh, your curiosity, for, and also see how uh, discovery can be translated into something that's good for uh, humanity in general, you know, for uh, the, 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 the marine life, but also at the end of the day for, um, for the world and all its inhabitants. Awesome. Thank you so much for the great advice. So um, we'll get to those public questions now. Again, for anybody who's tuning in, uh, ask your questions on Zoom using the Q&A button at the bottom center of your screen. If you're on Facebook, just comment your question and we, I get those fed to me as well. So we can answer those too. Uh, our first question here is from Mike. He's asking, do you eat grouper and is the fishery sustainable? So I eat grouper. Uh, I think in Florida, the fisheries has become to a sustainable level. Uh, I remember before they put the ban on uh, fishing during spawning season in Florida. So you have to know that in Florida, they closed the fishery during spawning season, which runs from uh, January 1st to um, May, uh, May 1st. Um, and since they've been doing that, we started seeing a return in numbers of uh, certain species, particularly guy grouper, but other species as well, uh, to the reef. And I remember uh, seeing that difference myself as, you know, like when I came to Miami, uh, you could uh, basically do a drift on the reef and, and see uh, several uh, black groupers. And if they are fishermen on the forum, they, they understand what I'm saying. You see black, black groupers, hiding under the edges and looking at you. And it was a very uh, interesting uh, sight to have. And I've seen that sight going away through the years until they restored the, the they, 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 they set the, the fishing ban during spawning season. And then we started seeing more and more fish on, on in those areas where they had disappeared actually. So yes, I ate groupers and I, but I, you know, I now, I, I used to spear fish a lot, but now I'm more hook and line. So it's harder to catch. So I guess uh, my impact is not, is minimal, I would. <laughs> um, so that actually sort of ties into another question from the public in terms of the fisheries recovering. 
Um, Dylan has, uh, it's a little bit of a long one. He starts off with a comment. He says, in the beginning, I think you were explaining that in the Caribbean, the amount of fish in the water has declined greatly. He understands it's due to a great amount of reasons, such as overfishing, pollution, oil spills, et cetera. Um, and his question is, if you think humans can bring back the life in our ocean so that we can continue our studies before everything vanishes, and if there's a way we can reverse the effects that um, and what has been caused. Yeah, that's a great question. And definitely it's a question that we all of us uh, have, you know, all of us who live on the coast and who depend on the, the, the health of our oceans. And uh, I'm gonna give you an example. So it started uh, in the Cayman Island. The Cayman Island is two very small islands uh, with about, you know, I don't know, 10,000 people at most and maybe less than that, uh, but a very uh, intense fishery, it's just like in the Bahamas. And um, I remember there was a, actually a coastal documentary that was showing uh, how fishermen would, make, would catch a load of fish during a spawning allegation of Nassau River in the Bahamas. And the same thing happened in, uh, in Nassau. And if you look around the Caribbean, Nassau groupers were used to be all over the Caribbean, right? If you go back to uh, fishing ports and talk to fishermen, wherever, whether it's in Venezuela, Colombia, um, you know, the, the Puerto Rico, anywhere in the Caribbean, they will tell you the stories that they used to be plenty full of coral groupers, of uh, Nassau grouper. And suddenly they disappeared, right? Suddenly they started catching less and less and, um, and less and less and also smaller and, and smaller until they wouldn't catch them anymore. And that's what happened in the Cayman Island where there was no regulation. There was actually no study of the, no knowledge of the dynamic of the fisheries in particular of the spawning irrigation. And uh, they basically wiped out the fisheries. And then suddenly, so that happened in I guess the early 80s. And then, so they stopped debining all the fishing. And um, one day a fisherman came back and said on another island where you used to be another aggregation, that aggregation was back. And they started fishing it again. And in a matter of, I guess three or four months, they pulled out about 2000 fish from the aggregation. But then the fisherman came together and say, if we do that, the same thing is gonna happen again. So we have to do something about it, right? And so they decided to launch a project that would start studying the life history and the habitat, and basically the dynamic of the ecosystem associated with the, uh, the, the spawning uh, aggregation of Nassau Grouper. And that project is called the Grouper Moon Project, which is basically led by scientists at Scripps University uh, in, uh, in San Diego. And uh, it's been a project that started somewhere in the mid eighties and is still going on. And what happened is they, with a coalition that involved the government, the fishermen, the people, a lot of outreach to educate the, to educate the people, they started basically uh, studying the, the behavior of the fish, the natural behavior of the fish, their movement, their interactions, their um, uh, travel areas, their movement between sites, uh, during the time of aggregation and outside the time of aggregation to come up with a, a plan that would basically uh, protect the fish during spawning, but allow fishermen to also have access to re the resource. Because you have to understand that you, you can, if you, you cannot basically uh, stop people from fishing and ask them to, you know, find another way to uh, to survive uh, and to, to find food. So we have to account for uh, the livelihood of the fishermen to depend on that, but at the same time, uh, find a compromise that will allow the fish to recover. And that's what they did. And so starting with about maybe 150 fish back in the eighties, uh, the aggregation has been recovering and they are now, they are now back to a number of about 10,000 fish and all the aggregations that have, that have disappeared have now returned and are uh, manage in a way that fishermen can enjoy it, but also the fish can basically, the fisheries has become sustainable. So it's a very uh, uh, promising and hopeful um, uh, basically project that can be used as an example to protect our resources the same way and manage them the same way. 
So it's about understanding and then finding those compromises for fisheries policies is what it sounds like. Exactly. And you have, you know, the scientists as well as the government and the fishermen, the people who are impacted. And also it's about education, educate the people all about why we do what we do and the way we do it. You know, why should we stop fishing during uh, spawning irrigation time? Or why we still stop fishing at the irrigation, but allow fishing maybe outside the irrigation? Why would we should protect the corridors that the fish take outside the irrigation? Because one thing they realize is that the grouper, when they go to their spawning site, they actually don't go there and stay there, but they go there, go back out, call for all the fish, tell them, hey, we're spawning, you have to come and then come back to the site. So basically invite their, their peers to join the aggregation so that, uh, you know, everyone participate and more fish, more babies are being produced uh, from those aggregations. So it's a very important, it's very important to understand how the animal basically uh, behave in their natural environment uh, when it leads to spawning in general, what they do in their life so that we can adapt our uh, fishing industry to their life history in order not to harm the, the, the stocks. Awesome. So Dylan, the answer is yes, there's things that we can do. And uh, that we can, can in fact reverse the effects. So awesome. All right. Um, our last question that I think we'll have time for from the public is from Reg um, asking, have you tagged and tracked groupers? Are they migratory? If they travel or migrate, do they return to their birth locale to spawn? I have to say yes, and that's 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 a good point. So uh, it depends also on where they live. So for instance, in the Cayman Islands, all the groupers are uh, local to the islands. They don't come from other places, so they live around the islands, year around. And when it comes to spawn, they migrate back to their spawning irrigation where actually they were born. So, but they learn that through uh, the adults, all the older groupers who actually come and, and call them out and say, "Hey, come with me." You have to go there this time of the year. And so that's how they learn uh, the history of their species through uh, contact uh, between uh, the youngest, the young ones, the juveniles and the adults. So, um, yeah, so we, I, don't, I haven't tagged groupers personally, but uh, on, for instance, the wave glider that I use, we have uh, some uh, systems that allow us to listen to the tag, the fish tag. And so we can get an estimate of their movement uh, patterns uh, in the areas that we are surveying. But um, as I was saying, it depends on the sign of the size of the habitat uh, for whether the islands where they live are isolated or connected to other islands. And which means that some of the groupers from other regions may migrate to another island specifically for spawning and then come back to their uh, regular habitat. But Yes, uh, adult groupers always go back to the same site for uh, where they were born to spawn. Cool. It's such an interesting thing about animals and that innate ability. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Laurent, and teaching me so much about groupers. They might be my new favorite fish. <laughs> I don't know if I had a favorite fish before now, but I'm going to go with groupers now. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much for joining us my pleasure yeah. great time and then of course, watching. yeah of course always thank you to the audience for tuning in and providing wonderful questions as well um next week's behind the science is going to feature fau's harbor branch executive director dr jim sullivan he has spent most of his career studying phytoplankton or microscopic algae and he start, is working on developing optical uh, sensors and different techniques to try and understand their physiology and also their ecology in the ocean. And he uh, has done a lot of really cool work with harmful algal blooms. That's really his particular interest. Um, trying to improve the scientific understanding of them, and then also working to improve the education of the public, of water management agencies, and even policymakers, so that we can uh, better understand those events and uh, hopefully have uh, the public 
understand what's going on and what they can do to help. So we hope you'll zoom in next Wednesday, June 3rd at 4 p.m. to hear more about him and his very wonderful career thus far. He's a great leader and we're lucky to have him as one of our guests on this uh, series. In the meantime, if you are interested in learning more about Harbor Branch or about some of the research projects that Laurent talked about, you can visit us online at www.fau.edu slash HBOI. And you can read about our research. There's uh, definitely at least one press release on there about the Gruber Guard project if you're curious to learn more about it. And then you can also check out all of our fabulous virtual resources, including all the previous episodes of Behind the Science. So I hope you guys have a lovely evening. I hope you enjoyed today's show and we'll see you guys next week. Bye.